Welcome, welcome, everyone. Okay, we're gonna be respectful of everyone's time. It's seven o'clock, time to get this party started. Welcome to this learning and sharing experience, weaving your book together. I am Jocelyn and I'll be moderating this talk with Dr. Patty Rose and Dr. Courtney Rose this evening. I will formally introduce them both in just a second, but I just wanted to prime the runway a little bit. Uh, share first, I am super honored to be asked to be a part of this because it just speaks to my spirit and intention of being a lifelong learner that is ever growing and evolving, um, all by staying really connected to community and folks that just propel us all forward, which these two women will totally do with all their wealth of knowledge they have. Um, but I would bet money that by tapping in tonight, we all have at least one thing in common beyond our curiosity about all things authorship and publishing of our ideas. I am pretty positive that we all share a deep sense of gratitude for these two incredible women, just for leaning into the call um, to share what they have learned along the way. That is leading by example uh, is what I call staying close to the river. It's like we all benefit from that flow um, of genius between us. So you are in for a treat because the secrets of the craft and the pathways that they will be sharing about is just straight up gold. Like there is nothing like this out there. Um, so I'm already just so grateful for all the notes that I will be taking while I sit at your feet. <laughs> um, just because you've done it so well and so graciously, your triumphs, your stories, your genius, you're just so generous um, with all of us. Um, so just a few announcements. I will be manning the chat and the Q&A box as we sort of go through our talk today. So please drop anything that comes up for you down there. Um, and as we transition through different questions, we'll be calling on some of the questions that we have time for and then also at the end um, for a Q&A there. But without further ado, let me introduce the experts we have with us tonight. We have Dr. Patty Rose, who acquired her master's degree from Yale University, followed by her doctorate from Teachers College, Columbia University. She has served as a faculty member from adjunct professor, instructor, to the associate professor at the University of Miami, Florida International University, Springfield College, Worcester State College, Nova Southern, Southeastern University, Barry University, and Florida Atlantic University. She is currently the president and founder of her own firm, Rose Consulting. She is the author of many books, many, multiple, including Health, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Context, Controversies, and Solutions which is one of four published by Jones and Bartlett Learning with another book for this publisher in progress currently. She has self-published several books, including A Return to Black Love, The Joys of Black Fatherhood, Motherhood and Marriage Reveal that re was released in 2022 and several children's books via her publishing imprint Rose Consulting through Amazon. Throughout her extensive career, she knows what brings her the most joy in terms of work is writing books. She is proud to be an author. We also tonight have Dr. Courtney Rose, who has recommended for tonight that we refer to her as Dr. Courtney, since we have two Dr. Roses in the building today. She is an assistant professor in the Education Policy Studies Department at Florida International University and the founder of the educational consulting firm, Ivy Rose Consulting. She earned a master's in human development and psychology from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, followed by a doctorate in curriculum and teaching from Teachers College, Columbia University. Prior to beginning her doctoral studies, Dr. Courtney taught in both public and private schools with the majority of that time being spent as a math and science teacher in the Duval County Public School System in Jacksonville, Florida. Her student-driven approach to teacher education and development aims to provide teachers with the tools and understandings on how to incorporate 
students' voices and identities into curriculum and instruction. She is all about bridging students' cultural and academic and social identities, co-creating more meaningful and humanizing learning communities with and for the increasingly diverse students and families of today's school, which is the focus of her first book, Woven Together, which was released in December of 2023, and the audio book of Woven Together, which was released today, right? Today. Today. So go out and get that. It is brilliant. Um, and we're going to hop right in if you're ready. I know I'm ready. Um, and just start with our first sort of segment here, like the early stages of how do we get started? How did you get started? What prompted you to want to write a book? Take us back. <laughs> okay. I think I'll start. Is Sounds that okay? Good. Sounds good. All right. So let's start with why do you want to write a book? So this is the first question that I recommend that you ask yourself. And it's a very serious question because the why will lead you to the process of what you're gonna write about. And that is the second point that we're gonna cover, which is what do you want to write about? So for me, why did I wanna write a book? And then Courtney, I'm gonna, we have to just fess up to all of you, I think you know, but we're mother daughter. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna slip into the mom, the Courtney and so forth, so please, don't don't be concerned about our informality with each other. But for me, um, writing a book was a lifelong endeavor. Even when I was a little child playing with my friends and so forth and people who know me from way back, whatever was going on, I would always say, I'm gonna write a book about this. And I also was an avid journaler. So my first book that I actually wrote, um, published by Third World Press, was in fact my journal. Hmm. And my daughter, when she became of age, um, probably around, what, 12 or younger? For my first journal? Yes. Much younger. You gave me my first journal when I was probably seven, maybe, okay. seven or so, eight. Yes. Yeah. So I believed in journaling so much that, oh, I remember she's right, because I gave her the one with the little lock and key. <laughs> yes. To make sure that she would have privacy. Right? Yes. So those were actually called diaries. Yeah. Um, right. So she had her first diary. So that was my process. And believe it or not, it still is today. I journal. I write down everything. I always have a journal around me or near me with a pen. So, so that's the first question. Why do you want to write a book? And if you can figure that out for yourself, then I think you're on your way. Courtney, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think the question, although I was also a, an avid journaler and I even wrote my very first book when I was in sixth grade, we had this assignment where we had to write stories and then the teacher bought us these little blank books. And so that was my first time seeing my words in this sort of formal book um, format. Um, I think it was always something I kind of knew I had an interest in doing, but I never, it's still, even though I watched you do it, right, so much over my life, it still seemed like something that was a very, and it is a very major endeavor. So I wasn't quite sure when that would happen for me, it was kind of something that I, I thought about, it would happen way down the road. Um, and so I just knew I had a lot to say. Um, and I wasn't really sure if a book was the right format for it, but I knew I had a lot to say. And so I, when I, and we'll get to this later, but when I was approached about doing it, it felt like the timing was right. Everything just felt like the timing was right. So um, for me, why did I want to write a book was I knew I wanted to write. I didn't really know at first if the right format was a book until things started lining up and it became very clear for me. Yeah. So I think that I agree with that 100%. And then you get into which genre do you want to write in? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're very young, you have no idea. You're just jotting down ideas into your journal and so forth. But then when you get into your career, whatever that is, and mine was as an academician 
and working in the field of healthcare and so forth. So I, my first book, as I said, was a journal. It was a processing journal and so forth. And I was able to get that published. Surprisingly, I, I literally, we're going to go over the how to in a little bit, but surprisingly, I just went through the steps and I got responses from publishers. I had to choose which one. So I was like, oh my goodness, this is really happening. Later on though, I was a professor and I was asked to teach on this topic, which is cultural competency for the medical school where I was working. And it turns out that the majority of the students were white and they were going to be working in communities of color and they needed cultural competency skill sets. So I started teaching them. And then I said, wow, this is a very important topic. There's a lot of people who need this. So I started a consulting firm. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching and consulting around cultural competency and it was overwhelming. It was so much work. And so I said, I need to put this down in a book because that way the book can go out and do this work for me instead of me having to do it myself. So my first book came out of a need. Mm -hmm. so if you're writing about something in which there is a need or if it's associated with your craft, whatever it is, then you are an expert in that area and you have to deem yourself as that. You have to say, I know this subject matter. Let me put this down. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get started. So picking your genre. Um, so for me, that was nonfiction. And yeah. some of you might be sitting here thinking, well, I want to write a fiction piece. The same kind of rules apply, except that nonfiction is where you probably have that absolute expertise. What, what are your thoughts on that, Courtney? I agree. I think, you know, it just depends on how in what voice you want to to share the information, because I personally find that fiction books can be just as informative and teach us as much as nonfiction books, but sometimes nonfiction is the right voice to communicate what you want to share. And so similar to you, I knew that nonfiction was the right way, even though I always thought my first, somewhere deep down inside, I always kind of thought my first book was going to be a fiction story because mm -hmm. I consume so much. I, I, I love like reading, um, fiction texts. I, I haven't read as much since since going to grad school, but I used to just get lost in them. And I'm actually trying to find my way back to fiction um, because of the way when I was a kid and I would read and, and just be transported to different places and different realities. It felt like a form of exposure to new worlds and new identities and new ways of seeing the world. And so, um, but similar to my mom, I found my way to this book through the work that I did both in my teaching um, with my students and in the work that I do on social media, um, on Instagram and things like that, where I found that people were really looking for something that bridged the, the what, the how, and the why behind the ways that we engage in um, the development and implementation of our teaching practices. And so a nonfiction text seemed like the best way to bring this together and also afforded me the space to infuse some of the reflective practices that my work both in my classrooms and on social media have really defined like my unique approach. And so that just seemed like the right fit for me uh, and for what I was trying to share. It also gave me the space to put my own narrative into it, which was really important to me. Um, and to to stand in that expertise and that unique perspective that I hope I bring to the work uh, or that I know I'm trying to claim it. she said claim it. so that I know <laughs> that I bring you must, you must claim it you must claim it <laughs> as you're listening you have to believe in yourself so um we we yeah. both chose nonfiction, but this is not to take away from any of the other genres we have fiction we have nonfiction, sci-fi some of you might be interested in doing a coffee table book with your artwork or photography and things to that effect, children's books and et cetera. So, so those are the two main um, points that we wanted to make here in part one. Incredible. That's incredible. And we don't have any questions in the Q&A, but you know, I always got questions coming up in my mind. Um, and you <laughs> shared about 
you know, the journaling process. And I know that was a very, very deep personal and you've had longevity with keeping a journal for many years. And since you both wrote um, nonfiction books, I'm curious about the process in which you, and I know for Woven Together, especially um, that you went to those journals and like pulled out, made those connections, those personal connections to the nonfiction research and the text that you were experts in, you are experts in. So can you talk a little bit about how you use those journals through your writing and writing a nonfiction text? Yeah. Um, well, we'll get into our writing process like super specifically later. But for me, uh, similar to my mom, her, her, my mom mentioned that her first book started from her journal was a version of her journal that she wrote. But for me, um, I actually wasn't like I, there was no um I just sat down and started typing one day in a very journal list, like a style of writing that I use when I write in my journal, just letting things flow out of me. And a lot of those writings eventually became either whole chapters or portions of chapters. And so um, a lot of the, sometimes when I don't know where to start, I hit a journal. <laughs> <laughs> just start writing there. So that the same kind of just letting it flow that I bring to my journal writing is is how I, you know, I carry that over to the book writing process, just kind of letting it flow and not trying to say something that I think people want me to say and just saying what's there. And that's exactly what I bring to the journal. When you're journaling, it's just what's on your heart and, and you let it out at least for me. And I try to bring that same practice to books, to book writing. Well, that's a very excellent question, Jocelyn. I don't think anyone ever asked me that before. So while um, listening to Courtney, I was also reflecting on that in my mind. So journaling for me, when it comes to writing a book is a creative space. So for example, in the book that I wrote entitled A Return to Black Love, I'll use that one because that too is nonfiction. I was soul searching black love. I was soul searching it historically. I was soul searching it personally. I was soul searching it in terms of black families, uh, black children, black men, and their um, being misrepresented in our society in such a negative way and how I really felt so deeply about changing that and so forth. So I had a very specific journal for that. And it had a black woman on the cover mm -hmm. sitting in a yoga position. And I have a spiritual space where I spend a lot of time actually doing yoga and writing and all that. And I would just write all of my deepest feelings, my love, my black love thoughts, and let them just percolate. Sometimes it was poetry. Sometimes it was straightforward prose. Sometimes it was a rant because mm -hmm. I heard, I saw somebody write something stupid about one of our brothers or sisters or whatever. And I just let all of that percolate in this book. And I also um, let that ruminate by going back and reading what I wrote sometimes to see, you know, how do I really, really feel? Once I had that book in a place where I felt I had a lot of information, I was able to translate that into the typed page. So it took me a long time to actually translate my journaling for my Black Love book into a book because I was speaking deeply to our people. I felt like this was a calling. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the book. Other times, it, the journal can be a space where I'm just making notes and then adding my thoughts to those notes and so forth. But I thought that would be the most poignant example because the journal gets deep, y'all. If you're gonna journal, <laughs> it's private. It's yeah. not for the um, consuming of others unless you are ultimately gonna publish that journal. And it's a space where before you hit the keyboard, unless you wanna journal on your keyboard as my daughter pointed out, which is also very useful just let it go in there, free write. Let your spirit roam the pages and then translate it into mm. your book. Yeah. That's how I do it. The journal is deep, y'all. I've been doing it since I was a little girl. I have a valise filled with journals. 
And um, I always say, hey, at some point, somebody going to know everything about me. You know? yeah. If I don't no. burn those journals one day, it's going to be like, wow, <laughs> everything, you know? So keep that in mind. It's very personal. Yeah, though, that is so powerful. I got chills when you were talking about that process of like the deep soul searching that you were doing as in preparation to writing that book. Um, we have a really quick question, and this is a nice segue into starting to get into the nitty gritty about the process. Okay. Um, but before we go, you know, we're educators, we're teachers. And so I really appreciate this question um, from the chat about what it was like journaling at a really young age and you want to share a little bit of how that seed was planted and what that was like and how it might have manifested into what this becomes how it, it manifested into your authorship yeah I'll can I start sure absolutely <laughs> so I I mom you can you can you can make it nice if you want but I've been always quite a chatty one like just lots <laughs> lots to say um and I think of the journal was a was a place for me to get to know my my voice from a really young age and to get to know who I am and how I process things. I too have most of them um, from, and I'm sure they're somewhere even <laughs> in my mom's house because we tend to keep really important things like that. And I would sit as I got older and read back the things that I wrote from when I was seven, when I was 10, when I was 11, when I was 15, and got to w watch my like replay my um, development, my growth, my evolution, and I really credit the journal journal with how deeply I I'm in touch with myself, right, and how well I know myself, <laughs> and um, also how. I mean, I think it's the foundation for all of the work that I do, really, in this, I, this, whenever something major is going on, I, I'm so, I don't like to use the word programmed, but I'm so, um, I turn inward. I'm just so, I know that that's the place to go versus looking outward or trying to find something somewhere else. I go into myself and sit with myself and I credit that journaling and the fact that my mother put it in my hand and gave me, um, you know, really welcomed me into the ritual of journaling and, and the practice of journaling at, from such a young age, I credit that with my ability to do that and why I know my voice so well. Um, it, it's, I've thanked her profusely in the book and, and in real life, but I really do credit that very first journal with that. Yes, I think childhood journaling, um, I'm not even exactly sure how it started with me. Um, I think if I really were to sit back and think about it, it probably started with a composition notebook mm -hmm. and just writing things. But I am very observant. I see the world as a place for me to watch things and see what's going on and how people are behaving and what they're wearing and eating and all that kind of stuff. So journaling always was as a child, my way of recording what I was looking at because I felt nobody else was doing it either. Like all my friends were outside just playing and having a good time. And I was writing a book about our handball situation at the park or whatever. Or what happened when we rode our bikes? So, you know, I'm from New York. I don't know if you all have detected that yet, but you know, <laughs> I used to ride my bike everywhere. And life was such an adventure in Queens, New York to me. And I would come back to my journal and record what had transpired. So I just, that is why I know and have always known that I was a writer. Mm. So the journal was the key it's one of the secrets. It's not everybody's secret, I want to point out. So for some people, journaling is just not it. So I'm not saying this is how you have to do it. But for me, it was the secret. One of the key secrets to getting started as a child. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like you both share two totally different perspectives of like a looking inward and then also being very observant outward, which I yeah. can imagine as an author, you start seeing how your thoughts and your ideas can fit into a world or what you want to contribute to a world through your books. 
Um, so that's really beautiful. But now let's yeah. get to the nitty gritty. Like talk, let, talk us through <laughs> the process um, in which we get it going. So we have our ideas, they're there. We know we can do this. We believe it. What is the what are the steps that we should take um to writing a book? Okay, so I'm gonna start and Courtney, we'll talk back and forwards here. How's that? Sounds good. So before I get started, I also wanted to say that there is nothing in the world like having a little girl and you put a, a diary slash journal in her hands and actually see her deal with it. <laughs> And then ultimately later on, see her become a writer. So, so keep that in mind because I've witnessed that with her from being a little girl all the way till now. And I'm very proud of that. So let's talk about publishing. The first thing you want to decide is do you want a publisher or do you want to self-publish? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to speak quickly from the vantage point of both. I've done both. So I'm writing my 12th book right now. And the book I'm writing right now is for my publisher. And I think it's the fifth book for my publisher and all the rest of them have been self-published books. So the question is, do you want to publish? Do you want to self-publish? Do you want a combination of those two things? And then we'll talk about what the differences are. Courtney, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I had seen you do both. And so I agree. I think just like the genre choice, um, and I know you're going to share some of the pros and cons because we had this conversation when I first came to you about wanting to explore the possibility of writing a book. After you asked me, well, are you sure you want to write a book? I said, Maybe. And then we talked about the pros and cons of publisher versus uh, seeking a publisher or self-publishing. And so I think that really helped me to figure out for this first book, which was which would be the right journey for me. So I think it would be helpful for others to hear how you break that down between, you know, the differences, pros and cons. Those. Sorts. OK, so let's go over that. OK, so. You all lean in because this is the detail. This is how it works. And there's if not much variation. Ready. <laughs> so if you want to publish a book, there's some steps that you need to take. The first is we covered already. Figure out what how you want to write and what genre and so forth. Be certain that you definitely want to do this. Then ask yourself the question, do I want to publish or self-publish? What's the difference? The difference at the end of the day is money. Okay, I, I have to be very honest with you because you're getting less money in terms of royalty if you go with a publisher. If you publish on a self-publishing basis, you're gonna get more of the royalty, a higher, much higher percentage, depending on who you go with. And I'm not talking about vanity publishing where you're gonna pay someone to do that. We're not discussing vanity publishing here today. We're discussing self-publishing versus a publisher. So if you choose to go with a publisher, the first question is, well, how do I get one? <laughs> I mean, how do you just get a publisher? It's not very easy. I'm not gonna say that it's easy. It's a process. So the first step that you would have to go through is that you have to do a query letter. So we're going to talk about some of these things in more detail later, but you would have to put a letter together that summarizes what you're going to be writing about. And it has to be very specific with detail. You have to know the genre that you're writing for because you have to know which publishers are in that genre. And then how do you find them? Well, when I first started out, there was something called Writer's Digest. It was a big, thick book. To be honest with you, I haven't used it in so many years. Um, I know that Writer's Digest is online and maybe that big, thick book is still in the bookstore. They republish it each year. It has all the publishers broken up by genre, what they require to even look at your query letter. They're not even going to look at it if they don't look at query letters, because some of these publishers require you to have an agent. 
And you can't approach them unless you have an agent. I've never had an agent. Mm -hmm. Never. I don't have one to this day. And so you start with your query letter. You start with identifying a publisher once you know which genre that you're going to write in. And you get yourself prepared for, this is going to sound harsh, but get your heart ready for some rejection. <laughs> okay. Get your heart ready. If you're going into this thinking, oh, I'm just going to do this and it's going to happen just like that. It can. It happened for me like that for the first book. And I was surprised because I was told by everyone, oh my God, you're going to submit query letters to publishers. You're not going to get published, blah, blah, blah. I believed in myself. I put my letter together. Um, you can go online today and see sample query letters. Make sure you look at only successful ones and put it together and then submit it. And then once you've figured out which publishers you can approach, whether you want to have an agent or not, you're good to go. Some of them are going to write you back and say, um, thank you, but we're not interested. Some are going to write you back with a form letter. Mm -hmm. Some are going to never write you back. And you just, because why your letter went in the file, which is a trash can, right? So they didn't even read it. And then some are going to write you back. That's possible. And then that's when you have to ask yourself that question, am I sure that I wanna write a book? Because these people have asked me, if they write you back, they're generally asking you for more. They wanna propose it. Yeah. And then you do the happy dance <laughs> and make a decision. Do I really wanna write this book? And then it's go time. So I'm not making it sound simple. I'm just telling you exactly how it goes down. And then I'll tell you, how we can also go down without you doing anything. Um, so I'm going to tell that story because it happened to both me and my daughter. And that was after I became a professor and I started that consulting that I told you about on cultural competency. I got contacted by email out of the blue by an acquisitions editor. So an acquisitions editor is just someone who works at the publishing firm who's out there acquiring writers to write a book. And they contacted me because they heard about my work in cultural competency. That was a blessing, but that happens. So I'm going to let Quentin tell you about that because that happened to her for her first book due to social media. Yeah. So th that process happened to me. An acquisitions editor reached out, said they came across my work on social media and my, which led them to my website, which has much more information about who I am and the work that I do. And I'm sure also led them to um, the information on my university's page um, and got them excited because I'm teaching lots of students every semester. <laughs> um, and so the acquisitions editor then sends you, send me an email and asks me, hey, are you interested in writing a book? I said, um, yes. And so we scheduled a meeting. Um, she listened to some of my initial ideas and got a feel for if I was a right fit for their um, publishing company. And I did the same thing because at my mother's <laughs> advice, I was interviewing them too, to see if they were a right fit for me. Um, and I recommend that as well. And so once we realized that we wanted to take the next steps, together as a, um, they sent me um, their form for their proposal, which is just basically asking me to share what I want to write about, who I am, why I'm the person to write this book, and an a outline of what the book would contain and how I would structure it or how, you know, the, the structure and organization of the book. Um, I had about two weeks to get that together. Then I sent that back to them. They took about another two to three weeks um, to read it over and meet with the team. And then that was when I had to prepare myself. I could have gone through all of that and then they rejected the proposal, but luckily they didn't. So you still have to prepare your heart for rejection, even if someone seeks you out because you might propose a book that they then say, oh, well, we're going to pass on that. But We'll keep you in mind for a future project or, you know, we don't, now we've read it, we don't think it's the right fit. So 
it was a it was a smooth sailing process, but I still had to prepare my heart for them to come back and say, mm, thank you, but no, thank you. And I also had to sit with myself and think, well, now I might have to write this book. So I had a lot to sit with in those three weeks when they were reviewing the proposal and preparing to make me an offer mm -hmm. um, for the contract, for, which they don't call a contract, they call an agreement. Um, and so, agreement yes. yeah, that was my process um, to the agreement letter. Um, and at that point, this is where you, sh you know, I always talk about putting together a team here. I didn't and really realize how many things you have to think about. I'm very creative minded and, and all of those kinds of things. But when it comes to sort of the business end of things, my mind doesn't naturally think of all of the components that go into that. And so one of the, a couple of the people that were really important for me to have on my team or to, to touch base with as I read the contract and moved to the next steps was, um, my mother who knows the business and who knows this side of things. Um, so I really recommend touching base with someone who's done it successfully, oh. um, who has gone through the process of proposing a book or a book idea and then having it come to fruition um, as a book um, because they can offer. I mean, we sat down with both my proposal and my contract and went through it line by line. Um, and one of the things my mom really helped me to see that I didn't even think about was, you know, you're trying to sell this beautiful idea or trying to pitch this beautiful idea and they're thinking, how will we sell it? And so you need to speak mm -hmm. to both of those at the same time, your passion and your expertise, but also rec like help them see the market for it really clearly. Um, and then I have, uh, I also had some legal advice. Um, when I was going over the contract, they recommend, they actually tell you, you know, have your lawyer go over it or have a lawyer that you trust go over it with you. And you can go back and forth with them over some of the um, points of the contract. And so luckily we also have a lawyer in the family. And so I had him read the contract. My mother read the contract, compared it to contracts she's had. And so having folks who are familiar with a, the business of book publishing and the process of, of, of getting a book successfully through the process and also someone who's familiar with some of the legal um, parameters and the legal things that go into this um, is something that I highly recommend because there were things that without my brother going over it with a fine tooth comb, who is the lawyer in our family, I would have missed or not even known to ask a question about it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, if you don't have someone on your, you know, that you can touch base with, there are folks who I'm sure you can find online who can help you with this, but don't just go by their legal team. I would have someone on your side for that part because the contract part, I started getting a little down in it because I'm not, <laughs> I don't like all the legalese and all of that, but my brother and my mother and my father, both were, all three were just like, stay focused, stay focused, you know? Um, and really helped me to go through that process feeling very empowered and still keeping the insp inspiration that led me to the book process in the first place. Yes, because I believe that, I think Courtney's touched on something that we all want to hold on to, and this is secret number two, okay? Secret number two is that book writing is a business. Mm -hmm. It's your heart, it's your passion, it's your work, it's what you like to do. But at the same time, from the vantage point of the publisher, and that is whether you are publishing with a publisher or self-publishing, because when you're self-publishing, you must be business-minded. Mm -hmm. You have to think the business part through. So it is a business because why? Number one, there's a contract. Anytime there's a contract involved, you got to get serious because you can sign away that thing that matters so much to you. I wanted to just go back one moment to the query letter so that everyone understands what it is. The query letter is a very short letter that enables you for the first time to put down exactly what you plan to do on paper for someone else in terms of your book. You need it to be succinct. You need it to be very clear. It needs to have an outline of exactly what you want to write about and so forth. And you really need, if you don't get approached by an acquisitions editor, you must have a query letter. 
So that is very important. That's where the, the business side starts. That's where you're getting out of your head with your wonderful idea and you're putting it on paper. And then you're moving into that, which my daughter just explained, and then the contract arrives. arrives. And that is when you want to ask yourself, before that contract <laughs> is signed, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm dramatically pausing, <laughs> okay? Before it's signed, ask yourself, are you sure that you want to write this book? Because I guarantee you, you'll be asking yourself that question later. Like right now, I'm in the middle of a book, I'm writing it, contract is signed. There's no more, are you sure? What is happening right now is delivery. <laughs> you know, write the book. And we'll we'll give you some insight into that in a moment. But if you get to that contract, you need to have your team, as she said, ready to go. You know, we are blessed to have a lawyer in the family because you need to have a lawyer read the contract. Because it seems simple. Mm -hmm. The contract, when you get it, it seems, oh, yeah, this is pretty straightforward. You need a lawyer to get a hold of that to see what rights are you providing because you're literally providing all of your rights to the publisher. Um, but we won't get into that. That's another session. Um, That's a good then, segue. Yeah, yeah, that's another sec uh, uh, session. But before we segue into the next one, we want to talk about that advance and that royalty. Because in that contract, you have to figure out, are you going to get an advance, which means money that they're going to give you up front, or are you going to be receiving royalties or both? And so in your contract, you are looking at your royalty rate. You're looking at the advance amount and et cetera. None of this happens with self-publishing. There's royalty only, there's no advance. Okay. Yeah, we, had, we had one question um, that was sent to me. And you know, if you go on YouTube and say, how do you write a book? A lot of the like quicker ways to do it will pop up and people will go that way. Um, one question was about Amazon publishing and yes. if that is even like a, like a good option to take yes. like self-publishing. Is there like a place that you would put the Amazon publishing in the spectrum of um, options that we would have? Well, since I'm self-published, this is, you see, this is my copy with all the <laughs> things sorry to show you all my books get read by me and they get dealt with by me a lot <laughs> um but th this was published this is called return to black love this is an amazon publication mm -hmm. and and so i also have here in my lap here for you a couple of my children's books and my children's books are also amazon publications now why did i choose um amazon and not some other company? Well, because I'm familiar with Amazon, it was approachable, the royalty rate was right, and I could write the books, upload the document myself, which is very challenging, by the way, unless you're a really techno head kind of person, which, by the way, my daughter, Courtney, is that kind of techno person. I'm not. You got to be very detail-oriented and so forth. Um, it's very simple, and uh, in terms of getting it done, but the final process of organizing it and making it look right and designing your cover and all that, they have covers for you and everything. I did not let them do my cover though. I did my own. So if you look at this cover right here, um, I designed all of this. And if you look at my children's book covers, I designed all of them. So you get crazy when you're self-publishing because you are doing everything that your publisher would do. Mm -hmm. You're designing the cover, you're picking the colors, you're deciding how many pages, you're deciding the trim size. Trim size is, this is a trim size, this is a different trim size. So you gotta make every decision yourself, everything. And then when it's time for distribution, you gotta do it yourself. Amazon is there for you. Um, but you're doing it yourself. So I can't speak to any other self-publishing company and I'm not advocating in one way or another because I have no stake in Amazon. I'm just telling you that when I looked at all of the possibilities, it seemed to work for me. 
That, that So that would be my answer to that question. So it rates number one for me, but only because it's the only one. <laughs> Got it. Uh, we had one other question before we get into some of the, the how-tos in the writing the book and your tips and tricks for us. Um, it was about like the length of time that publishers would typically give to mm. write the book after an agreement is signed. Yeah, I think that's one of the terms you can negotiate a bit in the contract. Um, and I recommend it because you'll get a number of deadlines. You'll get the um, draft manuscript deadline and then the final manuscript deadline. Um, and so you can kind of think about they ask you, you should think about your workload, your other responsibilities that you have, family life, things of, of those nature that might impact your writing time when we'll get into that later. I had mm -hmm. 11 months. I think it's typically somewhere between a year and a year and a half. Is that Does that sound average to you? Bob? Yes. All of mine have been a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I agree with you. It could be a year to year and a half. I'd like to... It's not that I enjoy pressure or anything, but I don't want this thing dragging on for a year and a half. <laughs> I want it out of the way. So um, this is, I showed you the self-published books. This is my most recent book published by my publisher. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it's a big, thick book. It's about uh, 319 pages, but that includes the index and the table of contents. <laughs> so, you know, just to take some of that off. But this book I wrote in one year. So the one that I'm writing right now, I signed the contract in November, is due in November. So I'm going to do it in one year. And so far, I have never asked for an extension because if I commit to a year, I'm getting it done. And that's not an easy thing to say. But nevertheless, so she's right. My daughter's right. You must seriously take your, if you're going to use a publisher, if you do self-publishing, you could go on writing that thing for years, which is another problem. <laughs> my children's books, I became obsessed with the drawings, with the drawings, because I did the illustration. So I was obsessed with the drawings and it took way longer than it should have taken. So self-publishing does not give you the discipline that you need. Or publish, and I'm not against self-publishing, I'm just telling you the truth. But with the publisher, you're right, Courtney. I would say a year to a year and a half. Yeah. I and say with a, a year. with a stop <laughs> along the way for um the draft manuscript. The draft yes. manuscript will be due a few months out from the, the final manuscript. So the year mark is to the final manuscript. You have less time to write the draft manuscript, which I believe for me was about seven months, seven or eight months, and then yeah. we edited for the rest of the time. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That timeline is super helpful for me. I already see the visual of that. Now. It <laughs> makes a lot more sense. And I'd had no idea. You feel the stress, about that you feel the stress there. Yeah. Like, Everybody no, no, take I, a deep I'm breath. Just... We're getting into numbers now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. I had no idea of that sort of timeline. Yeah, in terms it's a year. It's about a year. But I yeah. recommend like you can communicate with your editors. You know, they want you to stick as close to that agreed upon deadline. But, you know, as long as you keep open communication they too want you to bring the book to fruition once you sign the contract. So that's one thing that my mother was really good about reminding me of when I would start getting stressed and overwhelmed is like, they want this book to come out. So right. just no, you know, relax a little bit. <laughs> like they were on your side. Yeah. <laughs> They're on yeah. their side, but they want the book to come out. <laughs> they, do. they want it to come out. Yeah. Got it. Oh, well, I think that's a great segue. I know time is ticking down, but we had, yeah a few different ideas for these are things that are happening within that year um, about the process. What would you give to us in terms of advice? Yeah. So the number one thing I got this piece of advice when I was writing my dissertation, which was the, the best dissertation is a done dissertation. Right. And so the thing when you sit down to write a book is a lot of people, like, we want to structure it. Just you have to write it. The best way to write a book is to write it. And so um, for me, that is whatever tools I have available, like writing becomes a very, like, you know, it's either some days it was pencil to paper or pen to paper. Some days it was typing on the computer. Some days it was recording into voice notes on my phone. Mm -hmm. Some days it was post-it notes on my wall, which if you follow me on Instagram, you see it, right? Some days it was more drawing, um, 
like webs and maps, like concept maps. But all of that was part of the writing process for me. And so I may not have sat down every day and written for 20, you know, for four hours, but I wrote or I processed. My mother and I like to say we were in the gathering, right? We were gathering. Um, and that is what I was doing constantly. Once I signed that contract, I was, that was it. We write. And that doesn't always mean I sit down here. There would be days where I, um, I didn't write a word, but I was doing interviews. I interviewed 13 people of which Jocelyn was one, right. For my, for my book. And I interviewed people. I was reading and listening to the interviews, watching the recordings of the interviews, all of that counted in my process. So um, my mom has a, has a little bit, I did not take this piece of advice and I, I think I, it would have helped, but hers is a very much more structured, not structured, but like to get the writing started. You want to share what you, what you tell people? Yeah. So what I tell, I've told my students this for many years and people that I work with who are writing a book, it sounds so simple. If you're going to write it on a computer, open your computer Microsoft Word file and just type chapter one, center it. Just write chapter one. You have started your book and then just start writing chapter one. You can go to chapter five after that, chapter three, seven, whatever. You don't have to write in order, but get started. Because the interesting thing is that I am absolutely 100% not a methodical writer. Same. Not at all. In fact, I am in a three week stretch right now where I haven't actually formally sat down to write a word. But what will happen is I will do an interview. I was I just got back from New York City and this is interesting. I'm writing about race and culture and all of that, which is what I write about. And my um, niece's husband is from Trinidad and he was cooking Trinidadian food and I was writing about people of Indian descent. And I said, you know, would you mind if I conduct an interview with you about being a Trinidadian person who is black and of Indian descent and how that differs from being of Indian descent? This man was in the kitchen cooking and I was, you know, processing how he fit into my book. So the reality is we signed an interview release form right there over the kitchen table. We did a fantastic interview and he will now be in the book. So that to me was writing because once you start writing the book, you're always writing. Mm -hmm. And notice that I said that we signed an interview release form. Okay, so you can't just be interviewing people without going through the proper channels and so forth, but you can have the ideas and all of that. So. Um, some people get up every morning at a certain time every day. They go to their desk, they open their computer, they sit down and they they write and uh, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> I am so not that. Neither am I. And neither do I. Know. I am a procrastinator like there's no tomorrow. And I think writers need to be told that because they have this vision of some kind of person that is just sitting. In, and there are people like this. And I'm not being judgy about that either. It's just that if I had to do it that way, the book would never be written. Mm -hmm. So I have to be able to do it in my own circular way. So if you're a circular kind of person that's not methodical and saying, I could never get this done. It's not true. You could, you could. But the I, thing is, the thing like that's that I could never get it done brings me to my second tip, which is don't fight your process, mm -hmm. right? Because- you might want to be the person who can sit down and and have that, you know, I write every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from, <laughs> from two to six, right? Mm -hmm. Or every time I when I take the kids to school, then I sit down and I write until I pick them up. And then you end up cleaning your house and watching three hours of Real Housewives of Potomac, like, you know what I'm saying? And, and all of that happens and you're like, well, I'm never going to write this book. It's because you're fighting your process, right? right? So if your process is to live and um, I say, you know, I'm 
a completely like a writer by inspiration, right? I'm, I have, to, sometimes I see something or hear something or remember something or look at a picture. I spend a lot of time looking at old photos or looking at materials from my days um, as a K through 12 teacher, because I was trying to get back into her headspace for a lot of this book. And so um, I just gave into my process. And mm -hmm. just believed and knew that the book was going to come out. Um, and so once I did that, I mean, it flowed. It flowed in ways similar to my mom's. There would be three weeks where I would write nothing, but then three days where I would write a chapter a day, right? Because I just gave into the process and um, didn't try to make myself a writer that I thought I should be, but just became the writer that I am. I agree 100%. And what we're saying here is inspiration or method. Mm -hmm. You're talking to two people. Unfortunately, neither of us are methodical <laughs> at the process. And you would think as academics, we would be, but I, I'm definitely not. I'm inspiration only. And um, and that's what drives me. And, oh, and in those in-between moments, though, I never stop journaling. Never, yeah. So I am doing that. So if I really get lost, you know, in the sauce with the writer's block and so forth, the journal is there. That's a good point. Like you have to, during that time, also continue to do the things that sustain, like build you up. So if that's yoga, meditation, journaling, exercising on a consistent schedule, keeping, you know, making sure you're feeding yourself well, but also indulging it, like you have to keep, um, giving yourself those moments where you can be inspired, right? Or you can hear yourself and, and connect with yourself. And writing is a journey into self and, and into your own voice a lot of the times. And even if you're writing something that feels very technical, you're still, you know, pulling things together. And so I recommend figuring out what's something, um, even if you're very methodical, right? And you're building a schedule, are you adding in moments to, um, move to sit in silence to be with your thoughts to reflect to journal to do whatever and you need to to kind of balance the process right it has to be somewhat balanced as well um and that also came with like the people I talked to we talked about having the lawyer <laughs> the somebody to look at the legal stuff but I also needed a lot of cheerleaders personally people to say there were many days where I was just like, this is not happening. I am not writing this book and <laughs> have people say, no, no, you can do it. You've got this. This is, and to remind <laughs> you of the why that you set out in the beginning, um, but also people who are going to, I, nobody, only two people looked at my draft chapters as I was writing them, my mother and my father, my father, you know, that was it. And they were selected because of the topic of the book, but also and their expertise in those areas, but also because I knew they would give me honest feedback wrapped in love because I was fragile, okay, during the process. And so I needed honest feedback mm -hmm. um, and I needed loving feedback. So, you know, I don't recommend having too many eyes on your work as you're putting it together because you want your voice to be the primary one. But I do, if there's a couple people that you can identify who will give you that honest, loving feedback, you, you, you're you going to need it. It's motivating. Sometimes they would read a chapter and they would say, it's amazing. And I'd be like, I'm going to go write another one. Like, okay. And that was just the motivation that I needed. So um, thinking about who those folks are, who can give you that along the way. Agreed. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I'm very... Um very particular about who can read my work while I'm writing. It's my baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so consequently, it's precious. I don't want, you know, if you have a brand new baby, you don't want anybody to drop it or carry it the wrong way or anything that would hurt you about it. Say, oh, your baby looks a mess today. No, <laughs> I can't handle that. All right. So you have to understand that this is my baby. And so figure out now, if you're planning on writing a book, who that is, because that can really, well, you know, you might be a little bit stronger. You know, some people can handle some tough criticism. I can handle some tough criticism, but not when it comes to my writing. Mm, I don't want that yet, you know, <laughs> not while I'm doing it. 
So think about your team. Yeah. Think about your team. Any questions from the audience uh, from the from the from anybody? Yeah. So um I think this is good as our time winds down here in our books crossing the finish line and we yes. submit them. After um, the manuscript, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I think we had one question about advertising, like what mm -hmm. might be a best way to advertise if you self publish, um, or maybe what is that process when you have a publisher? So we'll try to wrap this section up. We'll we'll take that question as we like kind of try to get through this section in a little bit quicker time because we we're we're recognizing we're gonna be over our eight o'clock stop time. But um, so you know, once you have the manuscript. You've gone through the editing process. Uh, for me, there was a number of rounds of this. I had a copy editor who um, looked at the gram, you know, just did the very mechanical edits. And then I had peer reviewers who looked at the content a little bit more deeply. They were other uh, folks identified as experts in the field. Um, and then because I was a first time author, I also got a developmental editor who helped me to think about the construction and the organization of the book in a different way. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, then you pick your cover and all these things. These are the very exciting parts about it that gets you really thinking. Um, my cover was an homage to Bell Hooks, um, teaching to transgress with the, the yellow. And then the this is. Uh, very symbolic of the title of pieces of us being woven together, but also a call back to my time as a summer camp counselor, where if you read my acknowledgments, I break that down um, because it was a time where some of these ideas started coming together for me. But you get your book, right? And I remember, I still have my box and sitting right next to me, actually, that my books came in. I don't know if I could ever throw it out because... You know, I'm sitting in my, I remember I was sitting in my house just kind of going about my business and a loud, some, you know, they didn't gracefully put it down, but it, I heard a loud sound at my door and I opened the door and it was my, it was this box. And I was like, I didn't, that order something? Because, you know, I, I'd be stressed ordering, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, did I order something? And then I opened it and, or I looked at the, the return address and it was from my publisher and I, it's my book, I knew it. And I immediately called my mother and I was like the only person I could think to share in this moment with me. And we opened the book together on FaceTime. <laughs> and it was such a, I think I sat with it for like 30 minutes and just looked at it. I just kept yeah. looking at it and touching it. So that moment, you're, it was something... I, it still makes me emotional, right? To to see all of the, that year of work and love and life that I poured into this book. And and some days I still just pick it up and just flip through it and like, these are your words <laughs> and you did this. So that moment, if you can, you can't even look for it. I, I didn't even think about the fact that I was going to get a box full of books. I didn't even, the whole time, once I got that final manuscript approved, I kind of just let it go and was looking forward to December 12th, which was the release date. And I think the books got to me about two weeks before that, so. Yes, and then when you when you receive your books, because I remember that moment for her, and when you <laughs> receive your books, just to step back one second on that mm -hmm. and say that, yes, all the things that she said about getting after the manuscript, you've written the manuscript, you submit it and everything, you get it to your publisher, all the editing and everything that has to happen will happen, correct? Mm -hmm. And that's what she was referring to, the peer review, the editing, the DEI. By the way, none of this happens if you self-publish. Yeah, you're your own you editor. you self-publish, you're your own editor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and be very careful with that because you don't want a tacky book. So you can't do it yourself. After you've read your book over and over and over and over, it's going to start looking the same to you. <laughs> so you. Must find someone outside of yourself, either someone that you know who loves you and who will do it at no charge, or pay a professional. Yeah, you to spend that money because otherwise, the criticism of your book, instead of the, how wonderful it is. It will be, oh, this book has a lot of misspellings and, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things. So you don't want that to happen. As far as advertising is concerned, mm -hmm. if you self-publish you on your own and how do you do it? 
You do it through the use of social media, email lists, going out and doing book talks, keynote addresses, any and every way that you can, depending on how far you want it to go. Mm -hmm. So it's all up to you. You put the time in, you put the money in, you put all of that in. If you want to um, publish, get your book published by a publisher, they do all of that. And when I say do all of that, let's be realistic. Yeah. They do all of that in terms of what they are going to commit themselves to doing. And that sounds like a very vague statement. What I'm saying is that you have to do more. Yeah. And they expect so. you to do more, correct, Courtney? Yeah, I think especially now with social media being such a big thing, um, they'll send you a lot of stuff with, at least my publisher did this with messages of like, you can use this on your social media. You can use this on your social media. Yes, yes. They are putting a lot of responsibility on the author. So whether you pub self publish or seek a publisher, um, they are putting a little bit more responsibility on the author to be a part of the marketing team. So think about where your audience is, think about who you you want your audience to be and mm -hmm. how, um, how you can get in front of them in as um, many authentic ways as possible, right? Um, and that speak to the message of your book as well. So if you can combine those kinds of things, where's my audience? How do I get in front of them? And what do I want to say to them? And mm -hmm. then kind of build that. And your team, the the publisher is doing stuff that you not you're not always going to see. Um, yeah. I remember one of my mom's books with her publisher, they were, I would tell her, they sent me another email. They're out here marketing. Okay. But they are putting a little bit more responsibility on the authors these days because of the power of social media. Um, so if you're not familiar with that space, um, that's another person you can, you can outsource some of that work. Um, but you can also familiarize yourself with it. Um, and even use it as a tool as you're writing. Yes. Book talks, book talks, book talks, try to get book talks. And only up to what you want to do, yeah. you know, because um, everybody has their own different approach. I'm more of the, yes, I go out, I launch my book. I do book talks. I used to do a lot of keynote speaking and, you know, running all around the country and all of that with my books. But now I'm a little bit more chill. I'm like, listen, I wrote it. It was out there in the world. I hope that it does well. I support it and I will go and do everything that I can. But I'm a little bit more chill now. <laughs> I am, I, just to be honest about it. You know, I just feel like the books have a life of their own. You have to trust that your word is going to be carried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, that's great. I know this could easily be like a two to three hour. <laughs> we could talk about all of these and there's so many more details included in each of those steps that I know we would love to like jump into. Um, there weren't any other questions in the chat or the Q&A, um, but I just want to personally thank you for sharing because I know this definitely um, broadened my horizons. I definitely romanticized and like the process of what it means to be a writer, <laughs> probably via the media. Like that's what it looks like to be an author. So this is definitely um, added to what I believe it means to look and sound and feel and identify as a writer um, by listening to you speak through your process and all that goes into it um, is definitely planted a seed it, with me. I'm sure it's planted a seed with everyone on the call here, just the process and how we can do this. <laughs> this is something that is totally within our realm um, in how we can contribute the work to the world with what our ideas. Um, so I just want to genuinely thank you for just being so generous with your ex expertise and story. And we want to thank you, Jocelyn. Yes, Jocelyn. Yeah, thank you so much <laughs> because, you know, it's hard to, so that everyone understands, this is a very challenging process to do, to write a book and um, to be able to put it in a synopsis in an hour and try to explain these key details, um, it's hard, but writing the book itself, if you have the passion for it and you feel that you can do it and you believe in yourself, I am telling you with everything that I have that you can do it. Yeah. And you just have to believe that you can do it because people will say to me as if I, I don't know, you know, 
how did you do this? So then I said, oh, wait, let's step back. I'm just a regular, ordinary person. There's nothing extraordinary about me. You can do this. And these are the same words that I gave to my daughter. I never had one iota of doubt that she could do it. I, I just didn't. And I don't have any doubt that any of you can do it. But you do need to reach out and structure your mind to believe in yourself first before you can attempt to do it. Once you have that, it can be done. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you. Did you want to share um, your website so how people can get in contact with you and find you before we head out? Yeah, sure. so uh, I'm on what social media i'm on instagram and x <laughs> or twitter formerly known as twitter i guess uh at both of those i'm at dr courtney rose um so uh you can find me there mostly on instagram um i'm also my website which is linked in the reminder email that was sent out a few days ago um is drcourtneyrose.com and that's where you can contact me if um, looking into any of the other services I get you can find information on the book there um, as Jocelyn said the audio book did come out today and we will be uh, mm -hmm. you'll get another email from me by the end of the week because we are raffling off three free download codes to the uh, woven together audio book so you can keep them for yourself or give them as a gift but you know I've listened and it's nice <laughs> yeah, I've listened to it. It's wonderful. <laughs> and um, I'm at authordrrose.com. So there you will find all of my books and you also will find the items, several of the items that are being raffled because I also, with a return to Black love, have merchandise. So I have hats and t-shirts and tote bags and the whole shebang. So you can go there, but somebody is going to win from those correct yeah we're giving away three black love items so right black love items <laughs> i'm also at dr patty rose on instagram i'm on um twitter i think and yeah definitely on twitter but twitter is naturalist cool mm -hmm. so no time to explain y'all it's just naturalist cool okay <laughs> <laughs> but you will find myself there i'm also on linkedin at dr patty rose as well as facebook at Patty Rose. So, and this new uh, threads, I don't even know what I am there. <laughs> oh, you're the but same. I'm on there too. <laughs> so, wherever social media is, I am in some form. And um, there's a lot going on, a lot of marketing and advertising. For those of you who are interested in how to market your book, because we're going, we're going with you guys are writing a book. So, and then it's going to be in a book form. So, you want to see it in action go to our Instagram pages and all of our social media and see what we're doing because this is the final secret I'm going to give you all. Ooh. When you are marketing your book, you're not marketing the book per se, you're marketing yourself. Mm. Because if people care about you, love you, love your work, they're going to be interested in your book. So keep people engaged in a very positive way and you will see the results. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Thank you all so much. Oh, and I'm not going to let Jocelyn get away without sharing what she does. So Jocelyn, oh. please tell people where wow. they can find you and what you do because Jocelyn is one of the featured teachers in Woven Together. And let me tell you, um, the genius and just authenticity and passion that she brought to the book is, is absolutely incredible, um, and yeah. has built such a, a bond between us. I'm just so inspired by her <laughs> and, and, and so please Jocelyn tell the people where they can find you too. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. So much. <laughs> Honestly, that was the first time I ever got an interview release form is working on your book. I'm like, I didn't know that was a thing, but I'm it's learning. About thing. It's so it started all way back then. Um, but yeah, I, my business is Revolve Learning. I'm on all social things at Revolve Learning. I'm all about joy and genius in the classroom. So empowering teachers to just lift kids up in the best way so that they can be the best selves. Um, so yeah at Revolve Learning on all things. <laughs> all right, y'all. So thanks for joining us. This has been recorded. So if you missed something, you want to circle back to something, you'll get an email from us 
once we have everything um, downloaded and processed. And we just really appreciate you for joining. And I hope that you found something that you could take with you on your next step in your book journey. Yes. And you can reach each of us if you want to have a more personal dialogue. And we don't want to forget that at our on our website. So there's a contact box. I think you have the same on your website, Courtney, correct? Yeah. What you're contacting. Yes, please do not hesitate because now that you have participated in this session, you're in our writing circle, okay? So <laughs> you can go to orthodoctorrose.com where it says contact me and you can send me a personal email. I will write you back. Give me a little time. And Courtney's website is drcourtneyrose.com and she has the same. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Good night, everyone. Bye. <laughs> nice meeting you all.